if you're not sure where to find it, it's short. So it's only a couple pages long. So if you get to like Matthew, just start going back a little bit. You'll you probably run into it. Um, but uh, so I'm excited to, to start a new sub-series. Um, when we talked about what we were going to preach next and what we were going to work through, um, I, I had the idea to, to go through the book of Jonah. And I'm really excited to be jumping into this new series this morning. The book of Jonah is a book that, uh, honestly, if you're familiar with Christianity or church culture or if you, like, ever spent any time in children's church or, like, vacation Bible school, you've surely encountered the story of Jonah, right? We, at least the part where he ends up in the belly of a, a giant fish, right? I mean, that's just something that, that we're familiar with. It's this fantastical story, and so it appeals to our imaginations and it piques our curiosity because... It's just something outside of the norm, right? We've not ever, none of us have ever experienced what it's like to be swallowed up by a giant fish. And, and so the story of Jonah is just one that, that appeals to our, our senses in a lot of ways. But the book of Jonah and the story of Jonah is more than just this, um, this beloved fable for us to, to think about, right? At the core of the book of Jonah, there's a lot more going on. At the core of the book of Jonah, it's the story of God's love and grace and patience toward wicked people. That's what the story of Jonah is really all about. And we see in the, in the story of Jonah, we see God's concern for sure for a, a whole city full of wicked people, right? We see that God has concern for this wicked city, and so he sends Jonah uh, to minister to them, or he calls Jonah to minister to them. But I think even more directly or, or kind of underneath all of that, the story of Jonah that we're going to study through is really the story of God's love and grace and patience towards a wayward prophet, right? Jonah is a man of God who finds himself in a, in a situation where he is, he's, for lack of a better term, he's backsliding, right? He's, he's thrown in the towel. He is, is running away from God. And so what we're really going to see throughout the story of Jonah is how does God pursue and love him in the midst of that. One source that I studied in preparing for today's lesson asked an interesting question. It said, when considering the story of Jonah, whose evil is greater? Is, it, is the, evil, uh, the evil wicked nation that's ignorant to God, is their evil greater? Or is it Jonah who is willfully and stubbornly um, disobeying God? Is it Jonah's evil that's greater? And then the flip side of that question is, which act of gracious mercy uh, from God's grace is, of God's grace is greater? Does God's grace abound more towards this, this ignorant people that, that don't know him, that, that don't uh, seek to follow him, that, that don't even acknowledge him at all? Or is God's grace greater? Does it abound more towards those who know what is right, that they know God, they know what's right, they know what's honoring to him, and yet they choose to disobey him. They choose to do something otherwise. I think considering these questions starts to get at the heart of the story of Jonah, and it really starts to get, if we're being honest, at the heart of our own lives, doesn't it? Like it starts to, to kind of press in. We can start to feel the weight of this story in our own lives. You know, we, we will relate to Jonah's struggles because we too know what it's like to, to want to run away from God. It's a natural inclination for us. We're, we're constantly wrestling with this spirit-fueled desire to, to glorify God with our lives, and then on the other side of that, we're, we're waging war against the desires of our flesh, these worldly desires to gratify our flesh. We know that struggle well. And sometimes we look at the sinfulness of the world around us and we see these things that are going on and we somehow think ourselves above it all, don't we? Like, well, that doesn't really apply to me. But the story of Jonah reminds us that even for the men and women of God, running away from the Lord is often easier, it's, it's often more appealing than we care to admit. It's many times still the natural inclination of our hearts. So a little bit of background on the book before we dig into it. Uh, so the, the author of the book of Jonah is anonymous, but we know that the source for the story of Jonah uh, came from probably from Jonah himself. I mean, that would seem reasonable, right? Where else would they have, have learned this story if Jonah had not passed it on himself? It was written potentially as early as around 750 B.C., but as late as 250 B.C. So there's a long period of time in there when the book could have been written, 
but probably for, for many, many years prior to being written down, it was a story that was passed on orally. So it's likely that Jonah experienced these things and that he told this story and that the story was passed down from generation to generation before it was ultimately written in the form that we have it now. Some scholars argue that the later dating for the book is more accurate because of some of the things that we see here. Um, one of which is that the, the author, um, he presumes the, the reader's familiarity with the book of Kings. There's no background given to Jonah here, right? We just kind of jump into the story and we find this character of Jonah and it doesn't really tell us where he came from or what he was doing, which is, leads us to believe that the author at least expected that people knew who he was. They were familiar with his story. There's also language things in the syntax of the language that, that scholars point at that say that it points more towards post-exile Hebrew. So it's probably more likely that it was written sometime around 500 BC or onwards. So several hundred years would have passed from the time when these events occurred until when they were finally written down. So with that in mind, we're going to jump into the book of Jonah. We're going to cover the whole first chapter today, which is a big ask for me because everybody knows that I like to use words and have lots of them. And so we will do our best to get through this expediently. Um, but you got, when you ask me to cover a whole chapter, just buckle up. I don't know what's going to happen. So. All right. So we'll start in, in chapter 1. Uh, we're going to cover the first three verses to start. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So there's a couple of key um, characters and places and locations that show up here. I want to give us just a little bit of background on each of those before we jump into really what I want us to study. So the first person I want to obviously give us a little bit of background on is Jonah. If God can feed people um, with, through, through bread that falls from the heavens, if God can sustain Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, and Daniel in the lion's den, if Jesus can walk on water or feed thousands with a few fish and a few small loaves of bread, if he can turn water into wine and calm a storm with the power of his word and, of course, rise again from the dead. If God can accomplish those things, is it too much to believe that he can save Jonah in the belly of a great fish? We also need to understand that Jesus uses the story of Jonah as a sign and a, 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 something that points towards his own resurrection. So it's important that we understand the story of Jonah is not a fictional tale. You see, when we call into question the truth of Scripture, any portion of the truth of Scripture, then we call into question all of the truth of Scripture, right? If we can't trust the story of Jonah, then why can we trust anything else that we read in the Bible? We need to know that God's word is trustworthy and true if we want to find hope in, in, in the, the hope that God intends for us to find within it. So that's the background on Jonah. A little bit of background on the city of Nineveh where he's called to go minister. The city of Nineveh was located in modern-day northern Iraq along the Tigris River. It would have been about 500 miles from Jonah's hometown. And it was the capital and largest city of the late Assyrian Empire. So it was a very large and important city in Jonah's time. We also hear about the city of Joppa or the, the town of Joppa. Joppa was one of the oldest seaports in Israel. It was an important harbor during those days. It would have been um, probably a short distance um, from, from Jonah's hometown. So it was, it was somewhere where he would go and uh, where he knew he could go and find, easily find passage to probably anywhere else he wanted to get in the ancient world. Today, Joppa is part of the modern day city of Tel Aviv in Israel. It's actually a harbor that still exists. It's probably one of the oldest ancient harbors in the world. And lastly, we see uh, the city of Tarshish mentioned. And the city of Tarshish is actually mentioned 24 times in the scriptures. Uh, it's not to be confused with Tarsus, which was the city that the Apostle Paul was from. 
Uh, it's described in the scriptures as a source of valuable goods and materials like gold and silver and ivory. It would have been an important ancient seaport. But the location of Tarshish is actually unknown. We don't know exactly where Tarshish is. Scholars have some theories about where it is, but the actual location of Tarshish has been lost to history. Um, it, it was obviously somewhere on the Mediterranean Sea, potentially as far east as, as Italy or either, even southern Spain. So we would have been talking about up to maybe 2,500 miles away from where Jonah, from Jonah's hometown. So you can see the contrast right off the bat, right? That Jonah is called to go to, uh, to the city of Nineveh, uh, 500 miles away, and, and he responds by trying to get as far as he can possibly get in the ancient world. So that's what I got for you for background. Let's dive into the actual uh, scriptures and see what we can learn from it. So I think the story from Jonah is unique for a couple of reasons that I want to point out to us this morning. The first thing I think that, that is unique about Jonah is that he is called as a prophet to go to the Gentiles, right? To a, a pagan city. He's not called to go to, the, to a Jewish city or to his own people, but rather he's called to go to a pagan city. So most prophets, that's unique because most prophets are called to go to their own people. The role of the prophet was to serve as a spokesperson for God, and so God typically used prophets to, to relay his messages to his people. They would oftentimes deliver warnings against nations, right, the foreign nations that threatened Israel. They would deliver warnings against them. That was not uncommon. But what is uncommon is to see a prophet called to deliver a message of salvation to a foreign nation. That's not something that we see very often in the scriptures. It's fairly unique to, to Jonah. The second thing that we see is that Jonah is disobedient to God's calling. This is unique, again, for a prophet, because prophets were called by God. They were um, marked by obedience to God, and, and as men of God, they were oftentimes lights in dark places, right? So in the midst of, of rampant sinfulness, God would call a prophet, a, a man, uh, that was, that was a, an obedient follower to him, a man that would take his message and, and serve as a, as a picture of true righteousness to his people. True po prophets were characterized in Scripture by their zeal for God and their personal holiness. So time and time again, we see prophets speak boldly to the people in the face of great personal danger. We see prophets following God's calling into unpleasant situations. We see prophets beaten and killed and, 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 and suffering for the message of God that they're called to deliver. This is who Jonah had been. This is the Jonah of 2 Kings, the Jonah that was fervently pursuing God, active as a prophet. The story of a prophet who receives a calling from God and runs in the other direction is unique, particularly to Jonah. We don't see this anywhere else in Scripture. Prophets weren't sinless, they weren't perfect, they were fallen, broken human beings just like you and I, but they were devoted to living lives that honored God. That was something that marked the prophets. And what we see here is Jonah is effectively renouncing his calling, right? He's hanging up his towel, he's throwing in his, his he's picking up his ball and he's going home, he's throwing in the towel, he's hanging up his hammer, right? He no longer wants to do the work that God has called him to as a prophet. Why is he seeking to get as far away from, as possible from God? That's the question that we need to ask. What happened that changed this man of God into a, a, a man who is, is effectively running from God? What is apparent from Jonah's disobedience, and as we will see unfold throughout the book, is that he didn't want to see God act on behalf of Nineveh. That's the, that was the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will. You see, the Assyrians were a constant threat to Israel at this time. They were, they were an a, 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 a awful people, a violent people, a wicked and sinful people. Israel would eventually pay tribute to the Assyrians to, to keep them at bay, but ultimately the Assyrians would eventually come in and conquer the northern kingdom of Israel and send the people into exile. They were powerful, fearsome, and violent. And the Israelites of the northern kingdom in Jonah's time would have lived in constant fear of the Assyrians. Uh, one commentator that I, that I studied to put it into context for us said that this would be like God calling a Jew to go into the heart of Berlin in the middle of World War II. That's, that's what it was like for Jonah. 
So it's easy for us probably to relate to why Jonah wouldn't have wanted to go and deliver that message, right? Well, who of us would want to deliver a message of salvation to someone who's constantly, uh, that's our enemy, that's constantly threatening our lives, that we'd have to live in constant fear of? You see, Jonah didn't want to see God work in the lives of the Assyrians. He didn't want to see God redeem or save or help the Assyrians. He was on board with God as long as God was ministering to his people, as long as God was following what Jonah felt was a good plan. But as soon as God wanted to do something that Jonah didn't agree with, Jonah decided that he no longer uh, wanted to follow God. Jonah faces a dilemma that's, that's common to, to all of us, isn't it? How do we respond when God doesn't live up to our expectations? Because if we're honest, I mean, all of us have expectations of God, don't we? There's things that we expect God to do, things that we want him to do, certain ways that we expect him to act. We have lots of expectations uh, of God. And so while Jonah's circumstances may have been different from ours, who of us here hasn't been standing in Jonah's shoes before? He doesn't like what God is doing, and his choice is simple. He can choose obedience, and he can follow God's calling and go to the people of Nineveh. Even though he do, might not understand what God is doing, even though he might not agree with it, he can choose obedience to God, and he can go to the people of Nineveh. Or he can choose disobedience, right? He can go the other direction. He can choose, the, he can say, my plan is better than your plan, God, and I'm going to go this other direction because I don't agree with what you're doing. I'm going to head off to Tarshish and disobedience. He quite literally was standing at a fork in the road, and each of us have found ourselves there probably more times than we care to, to admit. Can you relate to being in that situation? I'm sure that you can. I know I can. And choosing disobedience can, can, can be so much easier. Can it? Choosing obedience can be hard, but choosing disobedience can sometimes be so easy, so appealing, because it just makes promises that we so badly want to be true. Jonah wanted to see God's justice poured out on his enemies, but God had a different plan, and it was too much for Jonah, so he decided to run. If we're willing to be honest, we all have expectations of God. We think that God in any given situation should work or respond in a certain way. And when those expectations go unmet, we're prone to become frustrated and angry with God. It's just how we respond. I'll bet without much effort, every single one of us can think of a situation where we were frustrated or angry with God because he didn't act in the way that we thought he should, right? Or he, or he just seemingly didn't act at all, right? Which is ironically him acting. Like sometimes the answer to the things we want is no. How did you respond when you faced those unmet expectations? That's the question I want us to think about this morning. Would you characterize your response as one of joyful faith and, and trust in the Lord and peace in God's will? Probably not, right? More likely, like Jonah, you decided to take your ball and go home. It's a common response. This is why I think that studying the story of Jonah can be so helpful for us, because we can relate to this story. It's very relatable. It's very common. It teaches us that God sees us even in those dark moments, even when we don't want um, to be seen by him, even when we don't really want to have anything to do with him. He's still present in those moments. He's present with us. We can't escape his presence, and he offers us, offers us immense grace even in our spiritual immaturity, and that's what we're going to see here throughout the story of Jonah. So you may not be called specifically to go as a prophet to some foreign land, but I bet each of us as his creatures, we know that we're called daily to live in obedience to him. It's a common calling to each of us, just to be obedient to whatever it is that he calls us to. And both the big stuff and the small stuff were called to obedience. I have this conversation with my kids all the time. As they've gotten older, we have more and more teachable moments because they're experiencing the world around them. And it can be really difficult, right? As a, as a, 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 a human being, right, as a believer that's living in a world that is, is trying to, to call us to do all types of things that we know um, according to God's word, we shouldn't be doing to find delight in things that aren't fruitful for us, right? We know that struggle, and my kids, as they get older, are experiencing those things because they're in school with, with kids and fr they have friends that, that aren't believers, that might not believe what they believe, and so they're constantly faced with 
with the opportunity to, to make a choice, just like you and I are. And the struggle is real. And I, I admit that to them all the time because I know how often I fail to make the good choices or, or how often I fail to give in to those temptations or how often I fail to, to live in obedience to God and rather I, I delight in things that aren't honoring to God. Right? I consume things around me that aren't honoring to God. And so we have those conversations all the time about how hard it is to live as exiles in a, in a strange world, in a foreign world, right? Where the people around us uh, are doing things and experiencing things that, that we honestly want to experience, right? And, and, and yet God calls us to be patient, to, to obey him, to experience those things, to either to, to resist those temptations or to experience those things in the way that he has created them to be enjoyed. And that ultimately that's the better way. But it's hard in the midst of that to, to see that truth because the temptation of sin can be so appealing. What does the world say versus what does God say? That's the question that we constantly have to ask as believers living in this world. And we find God's standard in his word, word but that standard can be hard sometimes to, to, to follow, especially in the midst of, of everything that we have going on around us. Let's keep going in verses 4 through 10, see some more of the story of Jonah here. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried out to his God, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. There's several things that I want us to focus on in these verses. The first one is that there's two ways that we can interpret the storm, right? That's the first thing that we encounter is this storm that comes up upon the sea and it threatens to break apart the boat so the men are in real danger. And there's two ways that we can interpret or understand the storm. The first way that we can understand it is that it's judgment for disobedience, right? Jonah has been disobedient, he is fleeing from God, and now he is reaping the consequences of his sin, and God is pouring out this storm in judgment to punish him. That's one way that we can think about it. And of course, there's plenty of biblical precedents for God pouring out his wrath upon people uh, for sin. Um, we, we find this time and time again in the scriptures because disobedience is sin, and the consequences of sin is God's judgment and wrath. We know this is true. But it leads us to some important questions if we want to take that approach to the, storm, to the storm, doesn't it? The first question is, what about the innocent sailors? Like, the sailors are, are in danger too, right? It's not just Jonah. Jonah didn't get all out in a one-man rowboat and row, row out to sea. He's on a ship with all of these sailors. And all these sailors are in very real danger too. And of course, we know that, of course, no one is truly innocent, right? I mean, we know that, that, that all of us are guilty of sin. None of us are, are, free, are, are free from the guilt of sin. No one is truly innocent. But I don't think that's, that's not really what, the, what we should see here. See, I think what we can see here, if we want to take that approach, is that, that our sin does have collateral damage, right? So when I choose to sin, it impacts me, but it also can have collateral damage to the people around me. So maybe that's what's happening here, right? The other thing that we, that we see, though, is, is when we think, the other question we should ask is that should we then consider every storm that we face in life as punishment or judgment from God? I mean, surely, again, we, we see that in the scriptures. That's how, if you're familiar with the story of Job, that's how Job's friends thought about the, the Job's situation. Job was experiencing all these terrible things, and his friends came around him, and, and everybody would love to have friends like this, right? They come around him, and rather than lifting him up and supporting him, they, they, they ask him the question, like, 
well, what did you do to deserve this, right? That's their, that's their position, that's their, their posture, right? That if something bad or challenging happens in your life, then it must be because of sin. And Job refutes that, and God ultimately validates Job, right? If you're familiar with that, that story. It's also, though, the posture that many Christians take when they face trials, isn't it? Like whenever something difficult happens in our lives or when we see difficult things happening in the lives of others, we immediately think like, oh, what did they do to deserve that, right? What did they do to, to anger God that he's now doing this to them? But if, if that's the posture that we take, then how should we understand passages like James 1, 2 through 4 and Romans 5, 3 through 5 that teach us that God uses trials and, and difficult situations in our lives to mature us in our faith, to draw us closer to him? that we should find peace in the storm because we know God is at work. How do, we, how do we rationalize and harmonize passages like that with a belief that every time something difficult happens in our life, that it's, it's a judgment and a punishment for sin? So there's another way that we can, we can view the storm. We can also view the storm as God's sovereign act to reorient Jonah's life and his path back into fellowship with God, back into obedience, back into fellowship with God. It's God's grace in Jonah's life. God graciously uses means like the figurative or very real storms in our lives to reorient our hearts and our minds on him. It's a, a part of his grace towards us. This is the heart of those passages in James and Romans, and I think that that's the picture that God intends for us to see here in Jonah. See, God lovingly allows us to bear the consequences of our sin at times, it's a means for, for correction, for, for um, restoration, to mature us in our faith, to bring us back into right standing with him. Just in the same way that, that as a parent, those of us that are parents, that we've had to discipline our children over the years, right? And, and, and the act of discipline is always meant to be an act of love, to, to protect and to restore and to redeem something. Never it should be done out of anger. God, as our perfect heavenly Father, never, never judges out of anger. Right? It's always loving. Even when we see his wrath poured out fully against those who have rejected him, ultimately, it's a loving act. And that can be difficult for us to understand, and I don't even have time to unpack that. That wasn't even in my notes. I just threw that out there. I probably shouldn't have, because I don't even have time to unpack that. Um, so we'll just stick a pin in that one. We'll, we'll preach a sermon on that at some later date. I also want us to see, though, the contrast between the sailors and Jonah. In verse 9, Jonah claims to be a man who fears the Lord, which is ironic, right, because his actions are inconsistent with his profession. Who hasn't been guilty of that as well, right? Living and, and acting in a way that's, that's inconsistent with the profession of what we claim to believe. See, Jonah doesn't show any evidence of fearing God, He's so resolved in his actions that he's able to calmly drift off to sleep in the bow of the boat. In fact, the, the order of the events that we see in verses 4 through 6 may indicate that the storm started and Jonah sees this all starting to play out and it's then that he goes down and, and goes to sleep down in the boat. See, Jonah is a man acquainted with God. He knows God and he's seen his power at work. He's even been a part of God's power working in his people. Yet at this time in his life, he has nothing but disdain for God. The sailors, on the other hand, are, are pagan men who don't know God at all. You, you can see they, they talks about that they were praying to their gods. They were foreign men who lived in foreign cultures, and they worshipped foreign idols and, and false little g-gods. But they see and hear of the awesome power of the one true God, and they're immediately awestruck and afraid. They take the posture that we all should have when we see and experience the, the majesty of God. They're awestruck and afraid. They immediately recognize that to, to disobey Jonah's God is a bad place to be, right? They're in real danger. It's a truly awful thing. And then lastly, I can't help but immediately be drawn to the parallels between Jonah and Jesus, right? I don't think you can read the story of Jonah asleep in the boat in the middle of a storm and not your mind can't drift off to the story of Jesus who was also asleep in a boat during a storm, right? Both of these are, are teachable moments where God is displaying his power, 
but there's two very different lessons being taught. You see, Jesus, as the good teacher, is asleep in the boat. He's resting in the peace and security of God's will. Jesus knows that he, he can rest peacefully because he knows he's in no danger at all, because he trusts fully his heavenly Father. He knows that there's nothing to be afraid of because he is fully in, in the midst of God's will. The disciples, though, on the other hand, they're afraid, right? They, they struggle with fear and doubt. They're afraid, and they awaken Jesus. And Jesus teaches, it, teaches them this lesson that they have nothing to be afraid of as he rebukes the storm and, and calms the seas around them. And in this moment, then the, the disciples, too, know that, that there's no reason when you're, when you're in the center of God's will, when you're with Jesus in the center of God's will, there's no need for fear. The lesson is that the safest place to be is in the center of God's will, resting with Jesus. That's the lesson that Jesus teaches. But what's the lesson that Jonah is teaching? Well, on the other hand, he's teaching a very different lesson, isn't he? You see, without the firm foundation of trusting God's will, uh, it, 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 the storm becomes a source of chaos and destruction, doesn't it? Like everything's out of control when there's, when there's not that firm foundation to, to rest upon. Their circumstances are the same. Both men find themselves in, in this fierce storm, facing this storm. One man finds peace in resting with God. The other man gives up hope and just goes to sleep. That's what we see Jonah doing, right? He just doesn't care. He just gives up hope. He's like, I'm just, I'm just not going to even deal with this. We're going to lay in the plane as we cover verses 11 through 17. It says, Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may, be, may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to the dry land, but they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So here we see confirmation of the condition of Jonah's heart, don't we? Like that Jonah is, is, for all intents and purposes, suicidal, right? He's like, it's better for me to die. He's so, he's so re resolute and dead set on disobeying God and seeing God's um, plan for the Assyrians frustrated that he's like, even if I die, I'll still be accomplishing my plan, my plan, not your plan, God, but my plan. We could look at, at Jonah's uh, sacrificial, uh, you know, sacrifices as, as heroic, right? I mean, one way to look at it would be like, oh, yeah, he's the hero of the story. But really, what we know is that he just, he just doesn't care anymore. And he just is so, so dead set on, on disrupting God's plan that, that even if he dies, it, it's, it's good enough for him. He'll still accomplish his ultimate goal. And again, we see the contrast between the sailors and Jonah, don't we? We see this, the sailors, uh, as they're struggling to preserve Jonah's life, they're doing everything they can. Jonah says, just throw me in the sea, but they don't do that right away, right? They continue to row and, and work as hard as they can to, to preserve their own lives and preserve Jonah's lives. But even, even then, after they ultimately give in and cast Jonah into the sea, how do they respond? They respond to God in worship and with sacrifices. They call out to God in prayer. Ironically, God uses the stubborn and disobedient Jonah to save these sailors, which is, is ironic, right? He brings saving knowledge to the sailors, these pagan sailors, even in his disobedience, which is just another beautiful picture for us of how God can work even through our mess, even through our disobedience. And then, of course, in verse 17, we encounter the great fish that God sends to save Jonah. This is the, the climax of the story, if you will, for many of us, because this is the part that we remember from our childhood. This is the picture of Jonah that we all remember in the belly of the fish. But God is not yet finished with Jonah, right? 
He preserves his life even in the midst of his disobedience. Even though Jonah wants to, to be disobedient, even though Jonah wants to be disobedient even unto death, God preserves his life. Why? Why does God act on Jonah's behalf here? I think it's for the same reason that he calls Jonah to Nineveh in the first place, right? See, we'll see Jonah himself declare the answer next time when we study chapter 2 when he says, salvation belongs to the Lord. We sing it regularly here at the journey when we sing the song, It's Your Grace. Every verse of that song begins with the line, you will save whom you will save. And we see this in God's words to Moses in Exodus 33, 19, when he says, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. It's a question that we constantly encounter, like why does God pour out his grace to some people, right? And, and why does God continue to be graceful and merciful towards us even in our disobedience? It's a question that we constantly face, that we constantly wrestle with. It's a question that becomes a stumbling block for some to the point that they walk away from God. And I think as we study through Jonah, we'll start to see that answer um, come forth and blossom sort of like a, a flower. You see, today we've set the stage for the rest of our time studying through Jonah. So as I wrap up today, I want to present you with three questions that I want us to kind of keep in the back of our mind. So if you have, if you take notes, write down these three questions and then stick them in your Bible and in, 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 the, in Jonah here because these are the three questions that I think throughout this series I want us to be thinking about. The first question is, why do you run away from God? And notice I didn't say, why do we, or why do people, or why did Jonah, but why do you run away from God? The second question that I want us to keep in the back of our minds as we study through Jonah is, what happens when you run away from God? What happens when you run away from God? And then last, the third question is, how does the Lord deal with rebellious runaways? Those are three questions that I think we'll start to see the answer um, come into focus as we study through Jonah. And I think, I believe that this book offers us answers to those questions. And the answers to those questions have really important and lasting impact for us in our daily lives. You see, throughout the story of Jonah, we encounter all of these things that are seeking to do the will of God. We see the storm obey the will of God. We see the great fish obey the will of God. Later on, we'll see the, the plant and the worm and the scorching east wind obey the will of God. We'll even see that the pagan sailors and the, the pagan and wicked Ninevites ultimately um, obey the will of God. And all of this is contrasted by Jonah, a man commissioned by God as a prophet who knows God deeply, yet stubbornly and steadfastly resolves to resist the will of God, even unto death. And in the recesses of our hearts, each of us, like Jonah, like Jonah, can be stubborn resistors of God's grace, can't we? Like, this story is so relatable because each of us has walked a mile in Jonah's shoes. And it's my prayer that through our time studying through the story of Jonah together, we can get to the root of that issue. Like, why is that the inclination of our hearts? Why do we we resist God's grace? Why do we constantly kick against the goads, if you will? And hopefully we can gain a better understanding of our brokenness and God's abundant grace in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the book of Jonah. We thank you for the, the story that you tell us there. We thank you for Jonah's life that can, can be uh, uh, oftentimes a, a, very relatable, um, a very relatable story for us, Lord because we know what it's like to, to resist you. We know what it's like to become frustrated and, and angry um, with you when, when you act in ways that we just don't understand. Lord, I can't help but be reminded of the, of the passing of, of Ashton, Lord, the, the, a young boy that, that gets cancer. And, and when we look at that from, from an outsiders of the faith, look at that, and they see these things happen in the world, and they're just filled with all of these questions, like how come these awful things happen? Uh, why, why, does, why do these things happen? And, and how do we make sense of them? And it can be difficult. Sometimes in your grace, Lord, you, you, you let us see what you're doing. Sometimes you, 
you give us a glimpse of the answer to those questions, but other times you don't. And, and it's in those moments that we have to, to place our hope and our trust and our reliance on you and your character and who you have revealed yourself to be through your word and who you have revealed yourself to be in our lives so that we can trust you, that we can know that you are ultimately working all things for good, that when we, when we read things like that in the scriptures, that we can really, at the, at, down in, in the, the depths of our hearts, we can trust those things, Lord. We just pray that as we study through the book of Jonah that you would help us to get there. Sometimes the path from the things that we know to the things that we believe, the things that we trust in, can be a long and treacherous path from our, our heads to our hearts, Lord, and we just pray that you would help us to make that path straight and that you would help us to, to just trust you more fully, uh, that we would just be able to, to trust you even in our doubts and our unbeliefs. We just ask these things in your most beautiful name.